heart failure is a clinical syndrome that occurs when the heart is unable to meet the perfusion demands of the body. Generally, this can happen either because the heart is unable to pump the blood effectively, known as systolic heart failure, or heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, or because the heart is not filling with blood correctly, known as diastolic heart failure, or heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Important definitions to know include the cardiac output, which is the volume of blood pumped per minute and is given by the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. The stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped in one beat and is typically around 70 milliliters, which, when multiplied by a resting heart rate of around 70 beats per minute, gives a cardiac output of nearly 5 liters per minute. Systole means the contraction of the ventricles, when blood is being pumped out, while diastole is the relaxing or filling time where the ventricles are filling with blood. Not all of the blood in the left ventricle at the end of diastole is pumped into the aorta during systole. The stroke volume is only a proportion of it. This is known as the ejection fraction. For example, our stroke volume of 70 milliliters divided by a normal end diastolic volume of 110 milliliters gives an ejection fraction of 64%. A normal ejection fraction is roughly between 55 and 70%. A heart failure can happen when the ejection fraction is lower than 40%, which is where the name heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction comes from, or when the ejection fraction is normal or high, termed heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. More recently, a third subgroup was introduced, called heart failure with a mildly reduced ejection fraction, where the ejection fraction is 40 to 49%. Heart failure can also be left-sided, right-sided, or biventricular, and based on the symptom onset, may be acute or chronic. The etiologies of both have significant overlap, but in particular, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction has a close link with coronary artery disease, including myocardial infarction, as well as chronic volume overload coming from valvular diseases like mitral or aortic regurgitation, but also from the neurohormonal compensation via the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Dilated cardiomyopathy is also included in these causes that all contribute to impaired contractility. Significantly increased afterload, which is the pressure against which the left ventricle must contract to eject blood, can also result in a reduced ejection fraction. Examples include severe aortic stenosis and uncontrolled hypertension. This is because, in response to the higher pressure, the left ventricle becomes hypertrophied, increasing its oxygen demand, but also giving it a reduced oxygen supply, because blood cannot pass as easily through the thicker muscle, ultimately leading to ischemia and poorer contractility. The most common cause of heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction is diastolic dysfunction, coming from a stiff left ventricle for example, the left ventricular hypertrophy we just mentioned. Because the ventricle is thicker, it doesn't stretch as easily, and therefore won't fill as well during diastole, giving a diastolic heart failure. The same goes for other conditions that prevent the left ventricle from stretching as easily, including restrictive cardiomyopathy, myocardial fibrosis, and pericardial constriction. Either ventricle can be affected, giving left or right-sided heart failure. However, in most cases, if one ventricle is affected, it will have an effect on the other. The most common cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. Risk factors that are common to both heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction include obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and renal disease. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is seen in more elderly patients and is seen twice as commonly in females 
than it is in males. There is usually a higher comorbidity burden as well, including hypertension, atrial fibrillation, anemia, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The prevalence of heart failure in the general adult population is around 4%, with an increasing proportion of heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. If the heart is no longer able to pump blood onwards effectively, this can mean a backlog of blood into the lungs, resulting in pulmonary edema. This is why many of the signs and symptoms are linked to the lungs. They include dyspnea, meaning shortness of breath, orthopnea, meaning shortness of breath when lying flat, which may also cause paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is where there is intermittent shortness of breath at night. Also remember, backlog from the right side of the heart is into the vena cava and venous circulation, which is why you could see a raised jugular venous pressure, have right hypochondrial pain if the liver capsule is being expanded, and peripheral edema. Heart failure is primarily a clinical diagnosis. This includes an accurate history and physical examination, which can include bibasilar crackles on lung auscultation, peripheral pitting edema, a raised jugular venous pressure, abnormal heart sounds, including an additional S3 in a dilated ventricle or an S4 in a less compliant ventricle, and hepatojugular reflux. Laboratory tests include the N-terminal pro-BNP, which stands for brain natriuretic peptide, which is released from the ventricles and the atria during periods of volume expansion and pressure overload, as well as a diagnostic marker. ProBNP is a prognostic marker. Some studies have suggested that levels above 5,000 picograms per milliliter are associated with a 22.5% chance of mortality during the hospital stay. Imaging can include x-rays which may show pulmonary edema, pleural effusion or upper flow distribution and cardiomegaly. Echocardiography can be used to see the dynamics of the heart including its valves and to measure volumes of the chambers as well as the ejection fraction. Several scoring criteria exist which combine the above features including the Framingham score or the Boston criteria. The main aims of treatment are to reduce mortality and to manage the symptoms. Generally, pharmacological management is the first line. For heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, there are several medications that have been shown to reduce mortality. A relatively recent change is the introduction of an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor as first line agents. Neprilysin is a peptide that breaks down several peptides including natriuretic peptide. This is important because natriuretic peptides antagonize the detrimental renin-angiotensin compensatory mechanism, leading to vasodilation, less sympathetic tone, and reduced aldosterone levels, which together means less cardiac remodeling and a lower mortality. Sucubitril is an example of this class of drug. It is used in combination with valsartan, an angiotensin receptor inhibitor. This is because neprilysin breaks down angiotensin 2. Therefore, you'll have higher levels of angiotensin 2 if it is inhibited, so angiotensin receptor blockade is needed. The reason angiotensin receptor blockers and not ACE inhibitors are used is because neprilysin also breaks down bradykinin, and ACE inhibitors also prevent the breakdown of bradykinin. This means that using an ACE inhibitor would give very high levels of bradykinin and a high risk of angioedema. Together, these make up the first agent in a class of drugs known as the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors. SGL2 inhibitors reduce reabsorption of glucose from the urine in diabetes patients. In heart failure, the exact mechanism of the beneficial effects is not known, but the theory is that they reduce the preload and afterload, leading to better ventricular loading, ultimately improving myocardial metabolism and reducing cardiac fibrosis. Examples are dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Other medications include beta blockers, because they help counteract the neurohormonal cascade 
and also antagonize excessive catecholamines. They reduce heart rate and oxygen demand and also help to reduce the incidence of arrhythmias. We have already touched on ACE inhibitors. They improve mortality as they help interrupt the compensation through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone, known as mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, are another type of medication that help to reduce mortality and also have a small diuretic effect. These medications all help to reduce mortality in heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. European guidelines suggest that an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor or an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, beta blocker, aldosterone antagonist and SGL2 inhibitor should be routinely used in all patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction who do not have contraindications. Diuretics are used to reduce symptoms. They help to reduce blood volume and in combination with salt restriction help reduce fluid retention. They do not, however, reduce mortality. Digoxin can cause an increase in the cardiac output and may also improve symptoms. At present, there are no therapies that have convincingly shown to improve the prognosis in heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. But symptom control may be achieved with a medication used in heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. In both cases, control of underlying risk factors and lifestyle improvements are also recommended. In severe cases, patients may receive non-pharmacological therapies like cardiac resynchronization defibrillators or implantable cardiac defibrillators. Revascularization may be done in patients with coronary artery disease and valve repairs or replacements can be considered in valvular disease. The mortality from heart failure is around 50% in 5 years, often with the progression of the disease, although these patients may also die from sudden cardiac death. The functional status is commonly assessed with the New York Heart Association or American College of Cardiology staging systems. The NYHA system is a functional staging system that assesses physical capability and is used to risk stratify, including eligibility for clinical trials. The American College of Cardiology or the American Heart Association classification instead gives information on what stage of the disease the patient is in.